some of you might know I'm embarked upon a biography project with Martin. I've also been involved in a bibliographical project where I have everything he's written. But the biography is uh, taking a little bit longer than I would hoped. But I, within 10 minutes, can't say too much. So I picked one topic. And the reason I picked this particular topic is because in the last year I found some documents that changed my mind about a couple things, or at least told me things I didn't know before. So we're going to concentrate on the war years of, of Martin Gardner's biography. Now, in order to understand the war years, let's see how this works. We're going to have to go a little bit before the war years. Now, um, in the 30s, in the University of Chicago, where he lived, and after he graduated in 36, he stayed around the University of Chicago, went a couple other places, but basically that was it. Now, in the campuses at that time, there was the Oxford Oath around 1934 from the Oxford Union saying that, hell no, we're not going to war. Then there was the American Student Union, which was a thinly uh, disguised approach to communism. Then there were people on campus who were actually members of the Communist Party and so forth. Now, the thing is that Martin Gardner hang, hung out with all of these people. He was a fellow traveler. There's no other word for it. And, and so the fellow travelers you are, might know are people who hang out with these people but don't actually join the American Student Union or the Communist Party. Gardner has always described himself as a social democrat. Uh, he worked for social de democratic causes. After the war, he uh, supported certain uh, social democrat newspapers and candidates and so forth. He describes this at length in his book, Wise of a Philosophical Scrivener. But that's sort of the background. So that was the political aspect. Now, this is the new thing to me. In 1940, he wrote a letter to Senator Lucas. And it says, and I'll just give a couple of quotes here. You can almost read it as fast as I can read it to you. A present the present conscription bill seems to me to be a major step in creating a military economy in America, paving the way for an eventual fascism. All right, well, this sounds like really strong language, uh, perhaps not as strong at the time because fascism was a new word. If the only way to defend America is by measures that involve sacrifices on the part of the common people with no comparable sacrifices on the part of the stockholders of Standard Oil, then maybe such an America is not worth defending. So this is his political uh, leanings at the time. So the conscription bill passed, of course, and so in 1941, he wrote to them and said, I have registered as a conscientious objector, because he wanted to know why they didn't notice that. And he says, do I have the right to appeal? And so he appealed. In 1942, he's still in the, in the system. And at this time, he says, at, this t at the time I first registered, I was convinced of the validity of a pacifist, pacifist stand, best served by strengthening the democracy at home. Now that America has entered the war, I have lost my original confidence. As I stated to the board, I have never in my life encountered a moral problem as difficult to resolve. I feel equally divided, so I am willing to abide by the decision of the board concerning my classification. Well, before they, induct, before they um, took him, so to speak, he uh, enlisted. But the Army rejected him. The Army said, no way, we don't want you. You're handicapped because you are too skinny. So um, this bothered him. So he said, well, I have to do something for the war effort. So he enrolled in a ship lofting course. Ship lofting, if you don't know, is a drafting profession in which you draw things to a one-to-one -one scale. All right, so um, it's, uh, regardless, it's a, it's a draw big pictures, I guess. So uh, he took this course, but eventually the Navy decided, the Navy decided that weight was not a problem, and they, and they took him. He started in September. He went to boot camp at the Great Lakes Naval Station near Chicago. But uh, because they discovered he could type, and the fact that he had previously worked in public re re um, relations, they decided he really didn't need to go to boot camp. Instead, they sent him to the radio training school in Madison, Wisconsin. Now, this is a place where people were uh, brought in. Obviously, there's no seaport there. So but they would go in there to learn how to run the radio's communications. And he was there for over a year. He was the public relations officer. Uh, and he wrote uh, several things for them. Um, in particular, he edited the Badger Navy News. I have a complete run of the Badger Navy News. If anybody wants to see it, it's in my hotel room. Uh, but I brought the Badger. So anyway, the Badger Navy News is a four-page newspaper he put out for them. Uh, and he did this uh, week after week. And 
He also, if you can tell, that's him on the side of the poto there. He did publicity shots like that for them, and, and he did this for a long time. Um, he spent a lot of time in their library, doing, continuing his work on philosophy, writing articles, uh, getting to know some waves, uh, uh, bicycling, rowing. Uh, it was actually not a bad time. He got to know some magicians. I've got some articles from various magic periodicals where he talked to magicians at this time, living in Madison. But they moved him in the summer of 1944 uh, to the USS Pope, a destroyer escort. Now, the USS Pope, uh, because it is a destroyer escort, you might expect that it escorts destroyers. But that's not entirely true. They only did that on a couple occasions. Sometimes they escorted um, aircraft carriers. If you want to know more, talk to me later. I can give you lots and lots more information on all this. But he was a member of a killer group. What that means is that there were six of them that had sonar, which was relatively secret at the time, and they would go out and try to find submarines. And when they found submarines, they would drop death charges on them. So that was what a killer group did. And he was one, his group was one of six. Now, one of the things about the USS Pope that he was on is the month before he got on it, it did something very famous. Uh, it actually captured a U-boat, which was kept secret during the war because the Enigma machine was on the U-boat. So, um, but he wasn't on the ship at the time, so, uh, every, so that's kind of unfortunate because they'd make a great story. But a month after this uh, famous thing, of course, he joined. He was based in Norfolk, he stopped in New York City, Gitmo, and Liverpool. Now, just as a sidelight for people who don't know much about Martin and his globetrotting, uh, he may have been in Canada, I have no idea, but other than perhaps stopping in some Caribbean island, the only time he left the United States was when he stopped at Liverpool. Never been to Europe, never traveled. He never went to London. He, his only time Gardner was ever out of the United States was in Liverpool. Um, and uh, so just a little tidbit there. He was known as Buzz Gardner. When he joined the Navy, they said, do you have a nickname? He did not have a nickname. He's never had a nickname before or after this. So he thought it would be fun to have a nickname. So he told him his name was Buzz. <laughs> and they called him Buzz. I have lots of letters written to Buzz Gardner after the war. Um, so, in his group, um, one of the six boats was sunk uh, while he was inside of it. So, of course, it was a dangerous operation to be in. Uh, lots of downtime, of course, because if you're sweeping the ocean for submarines, you're going to spend a lot of time not seeing a boat. Here's a, a, a part of the crew. He had a lot of say about the crew. The crew had one Annapolis person on it, two or three people who might really be officer material, and the rest of them he described as farm boys. Um, so he, he liked the people, but he, uh, he had a, an inverted view of, of, of Navy discipline. He thought most people doing all of the work were not at the top, and he would say that in one way or another. Here's a little shocker for you. I like this photo. Um, that's him. Not, he doesn't play the trombone, oddly enough. But he found a trombone on the boat and, and thought he would learn to teach himself two or three songs, and apparently he did. Never played the trombone after that. Now, if you read the book, The Flight of Peter Fromm, a book I would encourage you all to read, and I've been carrying around with me all weekend, there are the war chapters. This is, the, this is his uh, book in which most of the book is a uh, discussion of Christian theology, in particular a recapitulation of uh, Protestant uh, fundamentalism and Protestant liberalism. But regardless, not related to that are the war chapters in the flight of Peter Fromm. And if you read those chapters, you'll find that almost everything that happened to Peter in the book happened to Martin. But what Peter did and thought, Martin did not do and think. So, uh, so the incidents are all correct and all taken directly. I asked him about each one of the incidents separately, and he verified them all. What is interesting is one of the characters in the book is named George Groth. Now, just George Groth was Martin. Now, for some people, you might re recognize the name because George Groth is a pseudonym that Martin used on occasions to write articles. I, myself, am known as George Groth in the National Puzzlers League in honor of Martin. So I actually respond to the name George Groth. 
Regardless, uh, in this novel, George Groth was a skinny fellow with bushy black eyebrows and a sad expression. Groth believes in Hitler must be stopped, but he has very low opinion of Stalin and Russian communism. These are all very true. Uh, he did not have, he, um, that's another, another talk. When the war ended and he was, the boat was being decommissioned, the boat went to Green Cove Springs. Everybody else went home, but because he was the yeoman, he had to stay and for another four or five months there, uh, decommissioning the boats. And while he was there, he wrote some stuff, including the poem, Good Old, Goodbye Old Girl. Now this is a poem for people who we just learned from Percy has a low opinion of his poetry. Uh, this is one of his poems. Uh, it's about uh, the boat and his experiences on the boat. And my uh, gift to you will be an annotation of this poem. Uh, it's written in the style of Carl Sandburg, whom he admired, though he would um, often, he would probably call it doggerel himself. But regardless, uh, you'll read more about that poem later. And in closing, uh, I could hardly wait to get out. When I look back on it, it was a kind of happy period. You didn't have to worry about what tie to wear and what you had to do. That's all. Thank you.